Welcome back. We will get started. You can find your seats. We turn now to Lecture 7. Lecture 7, I'm calling the Gifts of the Spirit for the Church. The Gifts of the Spirit for the Church. There's some overlap with pneumatology in ST2 as we talk about the Holy Spirit, but in particular now wanting to think about what this means in the life of the church. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You can see in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, even the heading there in the ESV, spiritual gifts, beginning at verse 4. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit... And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all to everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Gift or... You see this word, which is originally a Greek word, charisma. We use it to mean someone has a lot of personality or energy. But charisma means gift, is a flexible term. It's used in Romans 1 and 5 and 6 and 11, 2 Corinthians 1, Hebrews 2. Gift or gifts, virtually synonymous with service, with activities. To have a spiritual gift is to be given some service, some activity. It refers to divine ministry and its effects. So you can say that charisma, this spiritual gifting, is no more and no less than what the triune God does in the church. And we see that here, to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. There are varieties of gifts, varieties of service, varieties of activities. You see that parallel in verses 4, 5, and 6? I think these are saying the same thing. Gifts, service, activities. In fact, the only gifts mentioned explicitly as gifts. Now, this whole section are called spiritual gifts, and that's appropriate because verse 4 calls a variety of gifts, varieties of service, variety of activities. But the only ones explicitly labeled as gifts are healing, 1 Corinthians 12, 9. Look there to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing, and then again in verse 28 and 30, and then celibacy in marriage in 1 Corinthians 7.7. 7. So if you turn back to chapter 7, I wish that all were as myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. And that's in the context of Paul talking about his singleness and his celibacy. Just a parenthesis there, I think we need to be careful with that gift, so-called, in particular, uh, it's, the, it's the one gift that people pray they would not get. Lord, I just don't <laughs> want that gift. Uh, well, I, I don't think Paul is talking so much about some people just are born, you know, some people have the gift of no sexual desire or don't have the gift to desire to be married. It may be true that some people have very little desires in those areas. But I think the gift, as Paul understands it, is God's grace in his life to serve Christ more fully, even as he's single, to see God's purpose in it. Now, one of the reasons I say that's important, and I don't have the time to go through the exegesis of 1 Corinthians 7, but it is important because you do find the argument on the revisionist side related to homosexuality will say, well, how can you... If someone has same-sex attraction, how can you deny for their whole life that they could ever act upon any of those sexual desires if they clearly are not given the gift? They don't have the gift because they have these desires. So how can you make them do something that they have not been given a gift for? And that's a problematic argument in a number of ways. But one of them is, I don't think that's what Paul means by the gift that he has, that you just have zero desire for sexual activity or zero desire for uh, 
marriage, but rather it's God's ability to give you some contentedness and service in it. So really the the label of gifts is appropriate, but the only two specifically called so are healing and then whatever Paul is referring to there, contentment and celibacy and singleness. That does not mean the others are wrongly labeled. It does imply, however, that charisma in the New Testament is broadly the manifestation of God's grace in and through his people. A manifestation of God's grace in and through his people. And that's largely the definition that you find from Grudem and you find from Gaffin. And I use those two because good evangelical scholars and churchmen, and of course, Grudem, we'll say more about this in a moment, is charismatic or continuationist. And Richard Gaffin from Westminster is a cessationist. So they both agree on the essential nature of what spiritual gifts are, the manifestation of God's grace in and through his people. Paul's list of gifts are not meant to be exhaustive. Typically, four major lists are recognized in the New Testament, Romans 12, 6 through 8, 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, then again, 1 Corinthians 12, 28. If you still have your Bibles open, just look at that. God is appointed in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administration, and various kinds of tongues. And then Ephesians 4, 11, which we'll look at in more detail later in the course. Those are often given as the four gift lists, sometimes 1 Corinthians 7, 7. We saw that. And sometimes 1 Corinthians 4.11 are also added. These lists are not precise and they are not meant to be complete. This isn't so common, I don't think, anymore, but it certainly was when I was growing up and even early in ministry. Uh, it seemed like a new members classes would always have people take their spiritual gifts test. And it was a long hundred questions and then it would spit out and tell you your top three spiritual gifts. And it's not that it's wrong to do that, and perhaps it's helpful to realize. I think rarely there would be surprises there. You kind of know what you like to do, what people have told you you're good at. But one of the dangers with those tests is it presented this kind of ad hoc explanation as a scientific exercise, as if we could add up all the lists and here are the 24 gifts of the Spirit that you can have, and then you're, you can take an inventory and it will tell you which of these you have, as if you might not float from some to another, or as if Paul were meaning to give an exhaustive list. He doesn't mention music. I think music is, I would put, as a spiritual gift. It's what God uses through His people to build up the body of Christ. That's the purpose. The purpose of the gifts is always to build up the church. You see that again in chapter 12, verse 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Or turning over to chapter 14, verse 12, so with yourself, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the body. Verse 26, what then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation, let all things be done for building up. You who are going to be pastors will inevitably have somebody come to you, say, Pastor, I really, I, I, I really have a gift that I'd like to be able to offer to the church. Often said very sincerely, I'm just telling you when somebody has a gift, and in particular, when they feel very duty-bound to exercise that on Sunday morning in corporate worship, just buckle up, because it usually means, I would like to sing this song, I would like to play this piece, and if you don't let me do it on Sunday, then you're restraining my gift. I have this gift, and you're not letting me exercise it. Well, that thinking needs to be redirected, because that's a very contemporary way to think of gifts are for our self-expression rather than gifts, gifts are for the mutual upbuilding of the body. The gift is not something that I have inside me that I just need to get out. 
And so how dare you not let me teach, let me serve. And, and those, you know, I, no one ever comes and, Pastor, I just, I got a gift of administration. When are you holding me back? You know, there's all, it's always the public gifts. Could you just let me on Sunday morning do my taxes? Could I, I just got the gift in front of people. So the gifts are not for self-expression, they're for upbuilding. Every Christian has gifts from the Spirit, which is an encouragement that you can serve and also a challenge you should serve. And that's helpful just as you instruct your, your people in whatever context. If everyone has been given a gift by the Spirit, the good news is you can serve. You have something to offer, and the challenge is you should be serving. That doesn't automatically mean you serve on a church committee or you do something that shows up on Sunday morning, but you have some gift to build up the body of Christ. To be filled with the Spirit. Let me just say a little bit about this, because often filled with the Spirit is used in Christian parlance as a synonym for spontaneity in worship. You, you were led by the Spirit, or boy, that was really Spirit-filled worship, usually speaks of a certain kind of emotional register or a certain way of doing things, as if you can only be led by the Spirit you know, between 10.30 and noon on Sunday morning, but whatever was happening in your study Monday through Saturday was not led by the Spirit. Led by the Spirit only means spontaneity. Filled with the Spirit only means a certain kind of emotional register. What we see in Scripture, the indwelling of the Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit, the sealing of the Spirit are initiatory blessings that every Christian experiences. The fullness, then, of the Spirit is a continuous condition and I do believe there is a, an experiential component to this fullness that can fluctuate. I do believe, I mean, Jesus tells us to pray for the Spirit, so I believe we, we can have more or less of the Spirit in our life, not in a spatial sense that I just, you know, the Spirit has got one foot in, one foot out. He's doing the hokey pokey in my life. But you can, you can, you can have more of the Spirit's effect in your life every Sunday. I think this is almost literally every Sunday I pray for the Spirit's power as I preach, for more of the Spirit to, to give me unction as I preach and to be upon the people as they hear. So there is a right way, certainly, to speak about praying for the Spirit and the Spirit working greater fullness in us. But we want to understand that this filling, this indwelling, this baptism, this sealing, these are initiatory expressions that are true for every Christian. In Acts, being filled with the Spirit not only equips you for boldness and courage, it empowers you with wisdom, faith, joy. It is the work of the Spirit in your life. So being filled with the Spirit may or may not make you an emotional person. It may or may not make you a spontaneous person. What the filling of the Spirit does is manifest itself in worship, thankfulness, prayer, and submission. That's Ephesians 5, 18 through 21. I go into more detail on that in ST2 when we talk about the Holy Spirit, the personal work of the Holy Spirit. I won't say more about that now. I do want to come back to this question. I'm not always sure in the RTS curriculum where certain topics get discussed. Sometimes in faculty meetings, we sort of canvas the room. Or, do you talk about this? Do you talk about this? So I'm not sure when or if in other places in the curriculum you talk about the controversial gifts of the Spirit. But let's spend a few minutes here to talk about the so-called miraculous gifts. And there are, as you know, generally two understandings or two camps, cessationists and continuationists. Cessationists claim that some of the gifts, like tongues and prophecy, for example, ceased after the apostolic age. That's where you get cessationists. Something has ceased, that some of these gifts are no longer operative. They contend, number one, the miraculous gifts were only needed as authenticating signs 
for the initial establishment of the gospel in the church. So we should not expect that they continue for all time. Some of them, the more miraculous ones, were there at the beginning to authenticate the ministry of the gospel. Second argument, when 1 Corinthians 13 says, prophecy, tongues, and knowledge will cease, quote, when the perfect comes, this leaves open whether they might cease before that time, or perhaps the ceasing is with respect to the individual who possesses the gift, not the experience of the history of the church. In other words, that verse, when the perfect comes, is often one of the best arguments on the continuationist side. Well, the perfect, the old argument cessationist sometimes made was that that refers to the coming, the completion of the canon. Very few cessationists think that's a good exegetical argument anymore. But continuationists say, well, the perfect there is obviously the, the coming of Christ, the, the parousia. So these gifts must continue until that point, until the perfect, that is until Christ's return or until our final glorification. And the cessationists argues that just because it says that they will be gone when the perfect comes does not mean that they might not cease before that. Or that expression, when the perfect comes, might be speaking with reference to the work in the person's life rather than an epoch of church history. We'll say more about that in a moment. A third argument on the cessationist side, revelatory gifts like tongues and prophecy undermine the authority and sufficiency of Scripture. Revelatory gifts like tongues and prophecy undermine the authority of Scripture. And that has a lot to do with how we understand the nature of prophecy, which we'll hint at here and we'll have occasion later in the class to come back to. And then a fourth argument, the miraculous gifts we see today are not even the exact gifts that were exercised in the New Testament. They perhaps are analogous in some ways, but tongues, for example, is this really the same kind of tongues that they were exercising in Acts and in Corinthians. And that also leads to an exegetical question on whether the tongues in Acts and Corinthians are the same or different. Many on the continuationist side would say there's something different, that Acts are obviously known languages at Pentecost, and Corinthians is talking about a, a heavenly, angelic kind of prayer language. The cessationists would say, well, Shouldn't the clearer interpretation from Acts inform the less clear interpretation in Corinthians? And the tongues in Acts, we know, are known languages, so why should we think that the ones in Corinthian aren't known languages? And if they are known human languages that you're giving the gift, then where is that operative? That's not what, in Pentecostal and Charismatic churches, that's not what those who have the gift of tongues are expressing. In fact, there's a, I forget which, where I read, which book I read this story, but I think it was so, someone with uh, per, perhaps good or perhaps not so good intent at a charismatic service where there were tongues interpreters gave John chapter one in Greek and then awaited the interpretation from those who have gifts of interpretation. And you can imagine that nobody, nobody said anything like John 1. No one was giving an English interpretation of the Greek that was just spoken. Now, on the cessationist side, say, well, th there's an argument that this modern phenomenon of tongues is n and interpretation is not like what we see in the New Testament. Continuationists, because I've asked this question to them before, my friends of mine, would say, well, you've... you've misunderstood what this gift of interpretation is, and you're, you shouldn't be trying to trick us with known languages. Um, just showing some of my, my cessationist cards here, I do think, even if that's a bit tricky of someone to go in and give uh, you know, something in another language and expect an interpretation, it does raise the question, and I've raised this to my friends who are continuationists, well, then what, what, is, what is the gift of interpretation then? Okay, take out 
you know, somebody reading John 1 in Greek. I said, if you have someone in your church service with the gift of tongues, do their tongues thing, and then you have two people who both have the gift of interpretation, and they're both going to write down that interpretation of the tongue they just heard. Do you think they are going to say, come up with the same thing? Well, no, 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 no one that I've talked to is confident that, you know, you put, you put them in a, you know, a locked room and they come out and then they give their interpretation and their interpretation that they're interpreting the same thing. So is there any stable, semiotic, grammatical, linguistic meaning to the tongue's utterances if no one really expects that the interpretations are going to be at all the same, uh, then are we really interpreting something? So come back to that. Those are some arguments on the cessationist side. On the other side are the continuationists who claim that all of the gifts are available today. And I have you know, good Christians that I respect. I remember one time being on a panel. Uh, it was... It was, it was closed door and it was not recorded, thankfully, but I think it was me and Ligon. We are the good guys. <laughs> no, and then, our friend, and then it was Sam Storms and John Piper on the continuationist side. I'll never forget, I was making some of these cessationist arguments. John turned said, Kevin, that's just not like you. Usually your arguments are so biblical. <laughs> so he was, he was not very impressed with my arguments. So here would be on the continuationist side, our friends there. One, without a clear word to the contrary, we should assume all the gifts are still in effect and earnestly desire them. Isn't that what 1 Corinthians 14 one says? Earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. What sort of special hermeneutic do you have to say that the gifts are no longer operative? Shouldn't we assume that they are? Shouldn't that be the default? Second, I already mentioned this, but 1 Corinthians 13, the perfect there, if the perfect returns to the return of Christ, then doesn't it suggest that all of those gifts are operative until the, the return of Christ? Three, revelatory gifts like tongues and prophecy do not have the same authority as Scripture, so they do not undermine the authority or sufficiency of Scripture. They are of a lower tier. That's why we find that they're to be tested. The prophets are to be weighed and tested in the New Testament. So they don't undermine the authority of Scripture. There's something a little lower. And then four, whether the gifts are identical with the first century or not, we should welcome the Spirit's work in our midst and be thankful for the expression of God's grace and the, the good effect it has in people's lives, and they may not be exact, but they are at least analogous to what we find. I believe both sides have come to see that they do agree on more than they may have once thought. So I'm going to come back to my cessationist argument in a moment, but let me just give you some things that I think good cessationists and good continuationists agree on. So one, Everything must be tested against Scripture. Two, nothing is to be added to Scripture. Three, it's usually unwise to claim personal words from the Lord for someone else. I remember one of my elders in my last church, he had grown up in kind of a, well, not kind of, but in a charismatic church and had gone to that earlier as an adult. And he asked me one time, I said, what, <clears throat> you know, I didn't know what to do. I how would you explain this? He said, when I, when I was a younger man, I had, you know, my charismatic church, I had women who just told me often that God had revealed to them by a word of knowledge that I was to marry them. And I was just nodding. I was like, well, yeah, I mean, obviously we all got that. <laughs> obviously I had that all the time. <laughs> but he said what was so hard is he would get this, and these women would say this to him, and he would go to the pastor and the past looking like, pastor, man, help me out. And the pastor would be like, well, if they got a word from the Lord. And that was really what, what led him away from the charismatic church. 
and became reformed. So there are dangers, but wise charismatics would discourage that sort of behavior. For, and here's maybe a word, if most of us maybe are cessationists, we should be open to the Spirit working in non-discursive ways. There's a, <clears throat> a famous article, you can go look it up, by Vern Poitras from Westminster, so cessationist, but something like the, the non-discursive work of the Spirit. So that, that word, discursive, by, means by, by reason, by argumentation, by logical deduction, by rationality. So he was making the argument for non, as a cessationist, for allowing the non-discursive work of the Spirit, meaning even good cessationists can allow and should allow that sometimes you get a hunch to do something or sometimes you have an intuition. Some people call it prophecy, some call it illumination. He was calling it the non-discursive work of the Spirit. Now, I would hasten to add, we should be careful that we don't, we don't append divine authority to those intuitions or those impressions. After all, I'm the guy who wrote the book, Just Do Something, which is all about not being tied up in these subjective knots as if you need to seek impressions from the Lord for every step that you take. My brilliant theology is that impressions are impressions. That's what they are. And they shouldn't be given divine authority. And yet, none of us should think that, well, we really all make our decisions just based on Excel spreadsheets. And we all just very linearly, always discursively, this, 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 I come to my rational conclusion. No, sometimes you, you, you do. You have a gut. You have a hunch. You have an impression. You have an intuition. That's how we live our lives. And as long as we don't overstate what those things are, let's not underappreciate that we do make decisions in non-discursive ways. And the Spirit can work in non-discursive ways. Perhaps it can be helpful just to connect here to the confession for a moment. Here again, the first chapter of the Westminster Confession. Do you have to be a cessationist to be ordained in the Presbyterian Church? Short answer is pretty much. Uh, you can look at the PCA statement on this from decades ago, and I think it allows for enough, hey, we want to be open to surprising work of the Spirit. But the language of cessation is in the Westminster Confession. So at least some kind of cessationist you have to be. And when... A very good friend of mine in the RCA, we had been friends since college, and we were pastoring in the same classes, that's Presbytery, and we were both leading our churches out of the RCA, and I went into the PCA, and he didn't, and I was sad that he didn't, but he owned his own convictions. He said, I, I, just, I can't come around to cessationists. And he had some charismatic background, and, and he, he tried hard, and, and I respect him for realizing that the PCA wasn't going to be the right fit for him. So we left at the same time and went to different places. Here's what the confession says. It pleased the Lord at sundry times and diverse manners to reveal himself and declare his will unto the church, and afterward for the better preserving and propagating of the truth and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan in the world, to commit the same unto writing, which maketh the Holy Scripture to be most necessary. And then here's the clause. Th those former ways of God's revealing His will unto His people being now ceased. So that's what the Westminster teaches. So I say you have to be some kind of cessationist because it says there these former ways of God revealing His will have ceased. The best book uh, 
and it's a, a doctoral dissertation, so it's not easy reading, but it's worth getting. I think it's in fairly inexpensive paperwork now. The best book on cessationism in the Reformed tradition in the Westminster era is by a man named Garnet Milne. It's called The Westminster Confession of Faith and the Cessation of Special Re Revelation, the Majority Puritan Viewpoint on Whether Extra-Biblical Prophecy is Still Possible. Milne, M-I-L-N-E, published in 2007. He argues that the Puritans were overwhelmingly cessationists, but that their cessationism had some permeable boundaries. It's worth reading this section from his preface where he distinguishes between mediate and immediate revelation. Here's what Milne says. In the opening chapter of the Confession, the divines of Westminster included a clause which implied there would be no longer any supernatural revelation means by which God had once communicated the divine will concerning salvation, such as dreams, visions, and miraculous gifts of the Spirit, were said to be no longer applicable. However, many of the authors of the confession accepted that prophecy continued in their time, and a number of them apparently believed that disclosure of God's will through dreams, visions, and angelic communication remained possible. He asks, how is the cessationist clause of Westminster 1.1 to be read in the light of these facts? Was it intended as a strict denial of the possibility that any supernatural revelation for the purposes of salvation could take place? Or did its authors, as some modern scholars have argued, allow for a more flexible view? This book explores these questions in light of the modern debates and interpretation of the confession's language. And then here's his big thesis. It considers the difference between mediate an immediate revelation as understood by the Westminster divines and attempts to show that only immediate revelation was considered to have ceased, while mediate revelation, which always involves scripture, was held to continue. A little later, he summarizes again, this book concludes that the Westminster divines intended the cessationist clause to affirm that there was to be no more extra biblical immediate revelation for any purpose now that the scriptures were complete. The written word was fully capable of showing the way of salvation. At the same time, the divines did not intend to deny that God could still speak through special providences that might even involve dreams or angels, but that such revelation was always be considered mediate. It means Primary means was be held through the written scriptures, the unity of the word and scripture, word and spirit was maintained, and God's freedom to address individual circumstances remained intact. What he shows, and it was really eye-opening when I read the book years ago, I mean, you, there's stuff that the Scottish Presbyterians were doing up in the highlands that would give some charismatics a run for their money. I mean, it, 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 was, it was stuff that most Presbyterian churches would not allow for, and I think for, for some good reason. But Milne makes an important case, lest we be too exacting with the cessationist clause. Uh, and we can always say the Westminster divines you know, got something right or wrong. We just have to be willing to explain that. They're not infallible. But his argument is, they all agreed the majority viewpoint among the Puritans was certainly supernatural revelation has ceased, but they didn't want anything to be on the same level of Scripture. And yet many of them had stories, like he said there, dreams, visions, angels, but the difference was this was, this was immediate. These were you know, ange angelic visitations with Scripture or dreams of Scripture application. So it was not in place of Scripture, it was not supplanting Scripture, but it was, I sometimes label them, supernatural surprises. It's not what we would expect. This isn't uh, normal, this isn't ordinary, and yet we have a category for, I can't quite explain that. My coming back then, finally, to just some of reinforcing my cessationist argument, and has already hinted at. Uh, the, the key in my mind is how to understand tongues with relationship to prophecy. And the question of 
of prophecy, we'll, we'll come back to later when we talk about church office, <clears throat> but there is not one agreed upon conclusion among Reformed theologians. There are some who argue that prophecy is what we call it, a supernatural intuition or impression or maybe what Milne is saying, a kind of mediated revelation and that this still exists. Others, you know, in the Reformed tradition essentially equate prophecy whoops, with preaching. Think of William Perkins' famous book, The Art of Prophesying. He takes prophesying to be preaching, or at least preaching when it's filled with the unction of the Spirit is prophesying. And then there's the understanding that prophecy in the New Testament really was like in the Old Testament, a thus saith the Lord kind of revelation. And we'll come back to this, but these three understandings of, of prophecy can be found in the Reformed tradition. When we come back, uh, I'll tell you, this is what, what I think, but I'm uh, allowing that there are good arguments in these other categories. But you can see if prophecy is this sort of mediated revelation, it's certainly not scripture, but it's a kind of spirit-led impression, well then, yeah, maybe that still exists. If prophecy is, you know, spirit-filled preaching, certainly that exists. But if prophecy is a thus saith the Lord, hear ye, hear ye, then prophecy doesn't exist. And one of the ways in which charismatics and continuationists agree more than they think is that both sides agree. At least I'm thinking of, you know, conservative evangelical kind of charismatics. Uh agree that this kind of prophecy has ceased. So cessationists believe gifts continue, and continuationists believe that something has ceased. Every cessationist I've met w wants to say that the prophecy, the tongues that exist in their church, no one wants to say, you know what, write that down, pass it around, and staple in your Bible because that's Scripture. That scripture right there, that was a word from the Lord. You can take it to the bank. It has as much authority as scripture. So every cessationist I've known has said, yeah, that kind of revelation ceases. So in large part, the disagreement has to do with, well, what was prophecy in the New Testament? Was it akin to Old Testament prophecy or was it a, something a different kind of prophecy, because that's going to lead us to whether this is still operative or not. And we'll come back to that. So there's disagreement here. What most people do agree on is that tongues, when interpreted, are equivalent to prophecy. That's Paul's argument in 1 Corinthians 14, that he would rather have prophecy than a tongue. And if you have a tongue, you need to have an interpretation. So tongues and prophecy were both considered revelatory gifts, and a tongue, when interpreted, becomes equivalent to prophecy. And the reason that Paul favors prophecy is because they're understandable. Tongues <coughs> are a revelatory gift, and we see in 1 Corinthians 14, look at verse 13, Therefore one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret, for if I pray in a tongue my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. That's a key text, verse 14. can be taken in at least two different ways. The Spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So one interpretation is tongues sort of bypasses rational faculty in your mind. You're saying, you don't even know what you're saying. You're speaking out. You know, and, and there are certain ways in charismatic churches, they will often help you. They get you to repeat certain phrases and certain syllables. And your mind is unfruitful, meaning you've bypassed your mind. But the other way to read this, my mind is unfruitful, and this is Gaffin's uh, 
argument that unfruitful doesn't mean irrational or sub-rational, but it means it does not bear effect to others. It, it, it's not fruitful. It doesn't build anyone up because they can't understand what you're saying. So Gaffin argues, no, th- this should not be taken as the speaker speaking an unknown, supra-rational, angelic prayer language, but these tongues are known human languages that don't bear fruit for others unless they're interpreted. So verse 14 is a key difference. Perhaps the most important cessationist argument, which again we'll come back to several times in this class, is Ephesians 2.20. Just look there for a moment. Ephesians 2.20, built on the foundation. So it's talking about we are fellow citizens, saints, members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. Most commentators agree that the fact that Paul says apostles and prophets in that order means he's not thinking Old Testament, New Testament. He's not thinking Old Testament prophets, New Testament apostles. He says apostles and prophets, meaning these two two groups that are operative in our church today in Ephesus. That's why in chapter 4, 11, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. So apostles and prophets, not Old Testament, New Testament, he's saying these people existing in our midst today, some are apostles, some are prophets. Well, almost everyone agrees that apostles have ceased. Maybe there's lower K apostles, those who have, are sent out on a mission, have entrepreneurial gifts, but everyone agrees shouldn't say everyone because there's a, a movement in South America and movement among some charismatics that label apostles. But within our circles, those charismatics would agree that apostles have ceased, that apostles were those commissioned directly by Christ who had seen the resurrected Christ. There are no more apostles. So if we all agree that apostle is no longer an operative gift or office, doesn't that mean that prophets both here are foundational. What is a foundation? You don't, you don't build four stories and then the fifth story build another foundation. A foundation is once for all non-repeatable. So Ephesians 2.20, perhaps the most important text from a cessationist perspective, if, if tongues interpreted are equivalent to prophecy and prophecy is a part of the once for all non-repeatable foundation of the church, it stands to reason that both tongues and prophecy were for a certain time and no longer operative, which is why Grudem, for example, is at great pains to argue that Ephesians 2.20 should be translated, the apostles who are prophets, that it's uh, the, the prophetic apostles, because Grudem understands instinctively, well, yes, there's no more apostles. And so he tries to argue that these apostles are apostle hyphen prophets and I, I don't find many or perhaps any other commentators that find that that's a good way to understand the grammar where it clearly says apostles and prophets quickly then just back to first corinthians 13 i know our time is almost up if you look at go back look at first corinthians 13 because this is an important text verse 10 But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. It's structured like Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. Ephesians 4, 13 says, since we have the same, I know that's Corinthians, Ephesians 4, 13 says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of God. Of Christ. They're both speaking about some future maturity, some future perfection. And we know from Ephesians 4, verse 11, where apostles are mentioned. Apostles, they do not last until 
the perfect comes. They don't last past this first age of the church. Might it be a statement, therefore, in 1 Corinthians about certain things passing away without insisting that they last all the way up until that time? In other words, Ephesians 4 has a similar structure about what will happen until, until the measure of perfection, until the fullness, and yet we realize that those apostles don't last for all time. And so the similar kind of construction in 1 Corinthians 13, might that simply be saying that these partial elements will no longer be there when the fullness is coming without teaching us that they automatically all will be there until the fullness comes. In Acts 19.6, tongues and prophecy are linked just as they are throughout 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. So here's what Acts 19.6 says. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. So the fact that they're linked in Acts, where we know in Acts chapter 2, that the only clear example we have of what tongues were, we were known languages at Pentecost. And people were given the gift then to hear them in their own language. So the fact that in Acts where we know what they are, they're known languages. And then in Acts 19, tongues and prophecy are put together. Stands to reason that tongues and prophecy put together again in 1 Corinthians are also known languages. If you can make the argument that tongues are known languages, then almost no one thinks that that's what's happening. In fact, I don't know if anyone thinks that's what is happening in Pentecostal and charismatic churches. I could be convinced that if, if there might be the Holy Spirit's gift to some missionary to suddenly speak in a language that he or she didn't know before, I could be convinced if, if that's what you mean by the gift. But in charismatic context, this is clearly not what is happening. Gordon Fee just went, uh, died last year godly man, one of the leading charismatics. His uh, First Corinthians commentary is influential. So ending here, this seems to me to be a very significant admission. He says in his comments, uh, this is actually in his book, Empowering Presence, page 890. He says, whether contemporary tongue speaking, quote, is the same in kind as that in the Pauline churches is moot and probably irrelevant. There is simply no way to know. And he continues to say, it is analogous to theirs. It is a supernatural activity of the spirit which functions in many of the same ways and for many of its practitioners has similar value. That's one of the leading charismatic scholars. It seems a significant admission to say, I don't even know if this is the same thing that they were doing in Corinthians. But it's probably analogous and is beneficial to people like it was beneficial to them. There is no unity of interpretation for spoken tongues. No one thinks that two interpretations of the same tongues message would be at all similar. So even on pragmatic grounds, I have a, a hard time concluding that the modern tongues phenomenon is that spiritual gift described in 1 Corinthians. Uh, in Packer's book, he, he sort of tries to have it both ways and probably just made both sides upset because he goes to great exegetical lengths to say that the modern phenomenon is not, it's not what's happening here in Corinthians. And yet Packer, always you know, ironic, comes and says, well, but it's still meaningful for them, so I think it's good that they do it. Not sure if that's the best approach to it, but I sympathize with his desire to want to be unifying rather than divisive. So next week we will come under this category of gifts of the Spirit and at least spend some time with the question of women's ordination. See you next week.